This is the Ramana Maharshi, 40 verses on reality satsang, a time to listen, reflect, and deeply inquire into the self. Know yourself and be always free and at peace. Welcome. I'm Richard Clark, hosting this satsang. I'm a seeker like you, sharing what we love. I've been blessed with years of deep teaching and practice that I bring to the satsang. This week's reading from 40 Verses on Reality is verse 34. Illusion is born of ignorance. These are Ramana's words. It is due to illusion born of ignorance that men fail to recognize that which is always and for everybody the inherent reality dwelling in its natural heart center and to abide in it. And that instead they argue that it exists or it does not exist, that it has form or it has not form or it is non-dual or it is dual. It is easy to understand this using the analogy of the rope and the snake. Entering a dark room, you see a snake. When you turn on the light, what seemed to be a snake is only a rope. The illusion of the snake is due to ignorance of its real form and imagination born of that ignorance. Illusion is just imagination. The illusion of the snake obscured the reality of the rope. When the illusion is gone, when the light is brought in, the ignorance is no more, and the rope is clearly seen as it is and always was. It was never a snake. What's the use of arguing about the scales of the snake or its history? It was never real to begin with. Where did the snake go? It was never there. It was just an illusion based on misidentification. This illusion of being an individual person is also based on misidentification. The basis for this is your misidentification with a body and a mind. This misidentification started when you were but an infant and is built on long standing assumptions that you have never really explored or challenged. Thinking this, you see and interact with what seems like a separate world. From your view as a seeming individual, you notice what seems like a separate world, and you don't notice the light that illuminates your very being and the world. You notice all the changing things of the world and not the light of consciousness, which is always there, illuminating everything. Using Ramana's metaphor, you see the movie and never notice the screen. Without the screen, there is no movie. What within you has been hidden in the same way, 
by the misidentification which you take to be reality. That's what you must ask yourself when you reflect on this, when you inquire. We notice things lit up by our consciousness and never notice the consciousness itself. But are we the objects of consciousness or are we consciousness itself? There's a Hindu story about a fish who went to the queen fish and asked, I've always heard about the sea, but what is this sea? Where is it? The queen fish explained, you live, move, and have your being in the sea. The sea is within you and without you, and you are made of sea, and you will end in sea. The sea surrounds you as your own being. It's like that. What is the sea? Who am I? Now some notes on practice to experience this within yourself. What within yourself is the inherent reality? What is just imagination and assumption? What is always? Ramana tells us in this verse, to recognize that which is always and to abide in it. It is yourself. Now to the videos for this week. First is from Swami Adya Shakti and he is talking about this same verse 34. Namaste, and welcome to another episode of <laughs> Uladu Narpadu. I'm telling you what, making these videos is such an incredible journey because it takes me deep into the meaning and the practice of Bhagwan's slokas. You know, I have this principle that I don't speak on anything that I haven't tried or experienced. So I get to go into every one of these slokas really deeply before doing a video on them. And I hope that makes it more authentic and immediate for you. So let's look at today's disputing. The reality exists. It does not exist. It has form. It is formless. It is one, non-dual. It is two, dual. It is neither non-dual nor dual, etc. Is ignorance born of illusion, maya? Give up all such disputes. Firmly abide as the reality, which always exists without even a single thought as the nature of everyone knowing that reality in the heart by the mind merging within. So, <laughs> if you go back a few years to the beginning of uh, this YouTube channel, when I was a Buddhist monk, at least externally, <laughs> Uh, some of these discussions came up because people were asking this Nibbana or Nirvana that the Buddha was talking about, is it real? 
Uh, or is it something just uh, like uh, a carrot for the donkey, you know? A goal to lead us in a certain way. And of course, I came to the conclusion that yes, it's real. But in a way, it's also a fabrication. Why? Because the state of Nibbana, being a non-conceptual state, is also an objective state. In other words, it seems to exist outside of oneself, and one can perceive it as something separate from oneself. Of course, it's wonderful and blissful and amazing and beautiful and all kinds of, of wonderful things. But it's not the end. Actually, it's only the beginning. <laughs> For example, every experience we have, we have two ways to approach it two ways to look at it or experience it. For example, you know, I'm looking out the window here, and I could say, I see a field. I see some trees. I see a fence and some buildings off in the distance. Birds flying past, clouds in the sky. Huh? In the beautiful afternoon light in the rainy season. So, what did I just do? I deconstructed this experience into symbols and I made it separate from myself. I made it something that I can look at and consider as a bunch of pieces the ground, the trees, the fence, the sky. I made them all separate by using symbols. Now in reality, <laughs> the other way to look at it is as a single whole, a gestalt as the psychiatrist would say. One perception and actually, it's not clear where does the ground end, where does the tree begin, where does the tree end, and where does the sky begin, where does the sky end, where does the bird begin. See? There is no word for that whole, huh? Because each hole that we encounter we'd have to invent a new word for it. I mean, it's bad enough that people manufacture all kinds of useless things and then give them new names as if they were actually something new. So now we have all these brand names, Coca-Cola and Chevrolet and all these different names. What do they actually mean? Because the things that they designate are actually a collection of hundreds or even thousands of parts, all made by different people, assembled and sold as a unit. So really, the name, well, of course, the name is not the thing. The name is never the thing. But when we use names, we are talking about either an artificial fabrication, putting a bunch of pieces together into one unit, or an artificial deconstruction, taking one perception and breaking it up into a bunch of symbols, and that then we can uh, manipulate easily in our minds. See, it's very easy to assign names to this view out my window and then talk about it as names. But it's very difficult to go into the actual experience of what it is and encounter each thing as it is, without names, without thoughts. 
Now, Nibbana, Nirvana, enlightenment, and similar high states of mind are, in some ways, fabrications. Because we're putting together a lot of separate things. Our state of mind, our way of thinking, our way of looking at things, the way we feel about it, how it affects us, and so on. And we're trying to give it a name, Nibbana. But are any two experiences alike? No. So even Nibbana is not one thing. It's many, many things, many, many experiences. But all those experiences have, how could I say, a certain flavor, a certain taste. And that taste is, we are not using words, we are not using symbols. We're neither uh, separately assigning names to everything and breaking it up by analysis, nor are we concatenating it together by means of some kind of synthesis. The thing just is what it is. <laughs> and it can't really be described. And to attempt to describe it means we lose the immediate experience of it. It becomes an abstraction. It becomes something separate from our self, from our being. It loses the immediacy and the aliveness of the authentic encounter. So, all these high states of being, Nirvana, huh? or contemplation of the self are indescribable by nature. So what's the use of arguing about them? The only use words have in this connection is to describe how to attain these states or at least kind of point a finger in a certain direction and say, go over there and take a look. <laughs> go that way and just explore. Huh? There's something cool over there, something wonderful. So when we argue about these things, you know, there are a lot of people teaching and presenting about spiritual subjects on the internet and here where I live and uh, so many other venues. I don't get involved anymore with trying to say, well, your teaching is different from my teaching, and it says in this book that blah, 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 you know. I just don't get involved in it. There's no juice in it anymore. Because what everyone is experiencing is, in many cases, different. And in many cases, it could be the same. But maybe they speak about it differently. Or maybe they don't speak about it at all. So then how are we to know? Huh? Am I sharing my inmost heart with you? Not really. Not really. It would be difficult because where are the words to describe it? If all we have is words, and on the internet basically <laughs> that's all we have to share is words, and you can maybe get a little taste of some energy. But words alone will not give us the real juice that we're looking for. So that's why I don't try to perform or emote or share anything beyond just you know, the way I am. <laughs> And, uh, and you can ask anybody that, that really knows me, huh? like Skandamurti. I'm this way all the time. It's not like this is a face that I put on for being on video. This is just my ordinary way of being. So, <laughs> what can I say about people who want to argue philosophy? Bhagwan here says it's ignorance, born of illusion. Maya. What is that Maya? 
Maya is the idea that we can express or describe or share or manipulate things by means of words and symbols. It's a false promise. Huh? Just like the whole idea of selfish action, karma, kamya karma. Uh, the Upadesha Undiyar begins with a description of a bunch of uh, priests out in the forest performing karma kanda rituals for their own selfish benefit. They wanted wealth, fame, knowledge, mystic powers, and so on. And he describes this as ignorance. Now, maybe these guys were using a spiritual or a semi-spiritual technology that is far ahead of what anybody has today. But they were still ignorant. Why? They were using it for their own selfish benefit. They were not using it to help others. They were not using it to improve the world. They were only using it for their own benefit, greedy, selfish, self-centered. And we have a similar situation today where a very small group of people, comparatively small group of people, own most of the wealth in the world and control most of the assets on the planet. Are they doing it for the good of humanity? No. <laughs> doing it for their own good. So this is ignorance. This is maya. They think that by doing this they're going to get happiness, but actually all they get is trouble. Once you obtain something, once you acquire something, then you have to struggle to get it. And once you get it, you have to struggle to keep it. And guess what? Ultimately, it's not possible. Ultimately, that thing is going to go away. That's just the way the world is. The only thing that doesn't go away is consciousness, is the self, pure awareness. So that is what we should be cultivating. That is what we should be looking into. Because everything is going to go away, even this body and what to speak of the whole world that we see. And we're going to have to go someplace else and start all over again. So the reality is a state of mind devoid of words and symbols. And we can abide in this reality. The Buddha called it pleasant abiding. We can abide in this reality as the seer not the scene, because the scene is always changing. Even if it's something very wonderful and exalted like visions of heaven or angels or nirvana, nibbana, huh? meditation, ecstasy, all these things come and go. So why should we occupy our time with these temporary things? Instead, Cultivate the self, the seer, the knower, instead of the known. The seer instead of the seen. That is the gateway to real, durable happiness. Om Tat Sat. Om Hari Om. And now we will listen to my teacher, Nomi talk about the illusion of duality. Every illusion of duality is nothing more than the effect of misidentification, which alone constitutes ignorance or delusion. Non-duality is the natural state of self-knowledge. In non-dual truth, since you are not the body, nor a mind or an ego entity, you have never been born. For the unborn, 
there is no perishing. In non-dual truth, since the self is both infinite and indivisible, and you are that, why, then free from any other misidentification, there is nothing created, nothing objective. The Maharshi has given the instruction that one ought to abandon the objective outlook and know oneself. For without knowing oneself, one is only dreaming an illusion. If you know yourself, then there is neither dream nor dreamer. That is, no individual, embodied or otherwise, is born, nor is there any objective dream or world. The thing to do for self-knowledge or self-realization as we call it is to actually inquire as to who you are. Put the question to yourself not so much the phrase who am I but the introspection implied by it. Questing inward to know the nature of your own being, the innermost consciousness, which is also the abode of bliss. Every conception of dualism, every notion of being bound, That is to say, every apparent cause of suffering is due only to misidentification. If we inquire who am I and know our real nature, the very cause of misidentifying, the cause of imagination, is absent. then we know with certainty that there is no samsara, repetitive cycle of birth, death, and illusion. And that only Brahman, the vast absolute, is real. That alone exists. And that alone is the self. So the Chandogya Upanishad gives the instruction, Tatvamasi, that you are. This is to be known with a knowledge that is self knowledge, non objective knowledge. Known in the same way that you know that you exist right now. You have always had this knowledge. It is not time bound as in past, present, or future. This knowledge is innate. We can say this knowledge ought to know itself. That is, your being ought to repose in itself, free of imagination. Inquire within yourself and determine what your identity is, what your actual existence is. As a hint in the right direction, abandon the misidentification, the tendency to mix up yourself with what is not you, that is, with anything that is objective, anything that is discontinuous or sporadic, anything that is not eternal, anything that has birth and death, anything that depends on your senses to be perceived, anything that depends on thinking to be conceived. If you abandon such, you will really have given up nothing. For giving up the unreal is not like giving up something. 
and without gaining anything anew, you will find yourself established in the self as the self, which is the greatest peace and is the state in which reality knows itself, where God knows God. All right. Now let us meditate for a little bit, self-inquiry. Breathe in and breathe out. Long, slow breaths. Feel the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. Notice that you exist. Investigate within yourself. What is always? What is always there within me? What keeps changing? What never changes? Look within and see. Feel what is always. What is seen? What is known? Who is the seer? Who knows all this? Who am I? All right, let's close with a short chant. Om Shanti, 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 Om, peace, peace. Peace. Thank you for letting me share this teaching with you. This series on Ramana Maharshi's 40 verses on reality will continue in the following weeks. If this satsang was of interest, I have more for you, a free book site, 
a YouTube site, my podcast, and my blog. The URLs will be on screen next. Namaste.